can help me with one of my problems. Oh, sure. What's that? Buddy Driscoll, the kid with the nightmares. Yes? I want to go in. That's impossible. I've already lost one psychic over this, Alex. Well, I don't understand this. This kid is being eaten alive and nobody gives a damn. Oh, listen, that's totally outrageous. I'm sick that you haven't been able to help him. Well, then let me go in. I mean, look, if our research here isn't designed to help a kid like Buddy out, then what the hell are we doing, huh? I will not destroy this program by going too fast. You see? I either go in with Buddy or I'm out of the project. Then you're out. I'm not kidding around here, Paul. Either I go in or I'm walking. I know I can help this kid. You're a bastard. You know that, Alex. I'm doing this against my better judgment. Thanks. Don't thank me. This isn't my idea. Drink? Sure. I don't have to tell you. Could be in for a rough ride. I know that. Just tell me what I can do to help. There is a tribe in Malaysia called the Sanoi, the dream people. They believe their dream lives are just as real as their waking lives. The children are taught to never lose control in a nightmare. They've got to face their fears and conquer them. And I think that's what you have to do to help Buddy, Alex. Whatever his demon is, you have to help him face it. Hello, folks. Welcome to a brand new episode. It's been a very, very long time since we recorded one of these of the Cinema Beef Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Gary Hill, and with me tonight is uh, the one, the only, uh, our favorite, Iris. How you doing? Hello, hello, everyone, and how are you, Gary? How are you doing? Okay. Just uh, hanging out on a Friday night with you. That's that's never a bad idea, you know? Hey, why not, right? Why not? Why not? Why not, indeed. Oh, my gosh. Um, yeah, uh, if you guys follow me on social media, you guys know I had some health problems in there and scared the fuck out of these two and, you know, scared me. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's like having two moms, and I'm fine with that. You know, just, just <laughs> telling me what I got to be doing. And, 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 and I'm glad somebody gives a shit enough about that. And th- thank you. Hell all yeah. For, yeah, thank you all for giving a shit, too. I, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm not used to that kind of treatment. You know, but um, I'm feeling a lot better now. And I'm uh, I'm here for you, and I'm I'm all about filling my obligations in, in the near future. And I, I'm I'm getting it all together. So I'm, I'm either we start start a show out like this, and but um, it, it's it's whatever. Thank you, thank you for giving a shit. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know we all love you. Yeah, I, I love you back, girl. You know this. I'll start the show out the same way we always start these shows out. I'll ask Iris what she's been watching lately. Well, <laughs> last night I watched The Monsters. And um, I have to say, so Lynn and I, the wife and I, sat down to watch it. And um, I had fun with it. I liked it. It was extremely campy. It was um, silly. It had a lot of Easter eggs. Like, if you are a serious horror fan... You know who Count Orlock is, and you know a whole bunch of other little things that kind of show up. And it was just really, really fun to watch. Personally, um, Lily was kind of like a secondary character and really didn't need to be there. And if you really think about um, the Monsters, the original show, the antics were always Grandpa and Herman. Those were the two that were always getting into trouble, always you know, coming out okay in the end. And Lily was there just to pat them in the back and say, oh, that was a great way of doing things, guys. Um, So to me personally, I just guess, you know, Sherry Moon, just I think I was talking with Robin last night. I said she just doesn't have the finesse that the original Lily had. So see, but what I liked about it, and I watched this too, is that she didn't go for a carbon copy of, of, of that character. No, which is good. She didn't go for it. You know how she does. She like really goes for it sometimes, and she is very subdued. She was very funny in parts. You know, and I, I, it was working for me. And I'm, I'm not a mark for Sherry Moon like some people are. You know, she, mm-hmm. she shakes her ass and magic happens for some people. I'm, I'm not the guy, but um, yeah, she was fine. But Grandpa was the star of the show for me. Yeah, Grandpa and both, and Herman was fucking hilarious. 
I mean, he had, you know, the stomp and the laugh down pretty well for me, at least, I think. And People were complaining about, like, the one-liners and, like, the jokes he was doing. I was like, he's just doing vaudeville shit. That's all he's doing, you know? Yeah. That's all he's doing. And, you know, and it fit for the character, right? Um, and again, it's kind of like Lynn and I were talking last night also, it, you know, this is a Rob Zombie movie. He is not going to make, it's not a remake, it's a revamp. And, um, you know, you just got to watch it with an open mind. I thought it was fun and funny and stupid and silly. And um, I told my daughter, hey, you know, if you want something to watch for Halloween with Victor, here you go. No, my buddy made a good point. Um, a buddy I've talked to you for t- 22 years at least about movies. And I- I'm going to agree with him that this would work much, much better as an episodic TV show. Yes, it would have. It really would have. So if you had like a three part origin story in there, really, really, really cut the meat off that bone, you know, and then mm-hmm. like 10 episodes for a season, you, you would have got more because the best parts of the movie were, were when, you know, spoilers, they, they moved to America and then they moved right. in, and, and they moved, we have to move in a Halloween nights. So they're, they're around a bunch of go- ghosts and ghouls and shit, but they're all in costume naturally. And when they realize they're not, they're not there. <laughs> the movie's over. You, you you want more? Oh my god! You want more of those reactions, yeah. and you're kind of left wanting. So if anything, you know, I'll, I'll say that Rob Zombie left me wanting for the first time in one of his movies ever. You know, <laughs> right, right. And then there was a lot of cute cameos. You know, like um, Cassandra Peterson. That was a cute cameo. Cameo. I, when when I saw her, I did not recognize her because of the makeup that they had on her. But the voice is so distinct, right? And and if you've been listening to this voice since you were 14 and, and completely in love with the person that has that voice, since you were, you know, totally crushing when you were 14, you recognize that voice immediately. So I was like, is that Cassandra Peterson? And I, of course, looked it up on Andrew and then it sure was. So it, it, it's got a lot of cute stuff in there. It's lots of fun. I enjoyed it. And, um, I mean, you know, if you want something just to pass the time away you know check it out you know and if it's not your cup of tea then it's not your cup of tea but i enjoyed it and um and i've been i've been watching shit reality tv dude i've been watching like indian matchmaker and oh my god 90 day fiance uk and all this other shit and it's it just makes me feel really good about myself let's just say that of course sister wives why are we not watching sister wives i mean yeah, so that's basically it for me, man. Yeah, I mentioned, I, mentioned, I watched the monsters too, and it, it's it's there. It, it, it said, if you if you can sit through it and you can realize it is what it is, because yeah, he's a horror fan, but I think most of all, he's he's a monsters fan. And if you listen, and I, I'll recommend this: before you watch the monsters, go get that monsters go home Blu-ray where he does the commentary on it. Go watch that movie with with his commentary. And you'll see the love just pour through them about the monsters, you know. Oh, wow. Okay. No, you know, I did not know that that had a commentary, so I'm going to have to dig that out. Yes, it's really good. Um, what I watch? I watched um, a Shudder exclusive called Sissy yesterday. Hmm. This is a film about a woman who's a YouTube influencer who um, happens to come across a friend that she do long ago when they were when they were just girls this is an australian movie and she goes to what they call uh her, her she's gonna get married she goes to what they call her her hen's weekend which is an australian custom to where the girls have a weekend before she she's gonna get married this is like the weekend before that and you know she, you come to find out more and more about their situation that they were friends but then they weren't friends because something happens I don't want to give too much away, but she's bullied by this one girl. And then the bully is at the party. And then all these feelings start to come back up again. And then she remembers what she did. And then if you're, if you're bored 40 minutes in, like I was, like, I'm, I'm so, something better happen real soon. But when it happens, you're fucking with it through the rest of the movie. Because it's, it's just, it's bonkers. It gets bonkers. You know? Mm. There's, a, there's an effect in the movie where... <laughs> Somebody gets run over with a car, and all I'll say is two words Ooh. for that. Squished grape, okay? That's all I'll say about that. <laughs> Just imagine you taking a grape in your, in your, in your, in your thumb and your forefinger, and you squish it into those nice. fingers. That's what happens to somebody's head in this movie. There's a lot of great practical effects in this movie, too. And oh. 
you know, once once you get to the meat and potatoes of this movie, like, oh, this is kind of stupid. But no, no, it's it gets raw. And you're like, yeah, you're, you're in it from here. And it, it's smart, and it ends smart, and it's on Shudder. Go go check it out. Um, okay. And it's called Sissy? It's called Sissy. S-S-I-S-S-Y. Okay. All right, That's I'll have name. to check it out. Her name is Cecilia, so th- oh, they, okay. they call her Sissy, so they, you know, yeah. It's, it, it's done in a mean way. And um, other, other stuff, uh, there's stuff I meant to get to that I haven't gotten to yet. Uh, I rewatch Pool Hall Junkies again because I, I, I watch it like six times a year. I don't want to get too far into it, but it's basically about this pool hustler who gets out of the game and then gets back into the game. And Chaz Palminteri's in it and Christopher Walken's in it. And it's a favorite of mine and my friend. Um, one time we went to go see Michael Rosenbaum at a convention who's one of the nicest guys in the world he played Lex Luthor on Smallville and oh yeah yeah he's in some other stuff but when we brought him that Pool Hall of Junkies poster he went nuts because he's in that movie and he's been looking at Flash and Smallville stuff all day And oh wow it's loved by many people my, Ernie Reyes Jr. is in that movie my buddy got to beat him in like Cleveland or something and he said that's the only film I ever got to, I, I got to act in you know, be like do I do do speak lines and you know enunciate and you know <laughs> that's uh he was he was he's jazzed about seeing it too. So it must be a favorite amongst many of those guys, and that makes me happy that this is little independent movie uh, about a pool hustler that's directed by said pool hustler uh, was um it's, it's it's pretty good. It's one that I enjoy. Um big one that I can recommend. It's not, a, it's not a movie. It's a TV show. I've been pushing this since I started watching it and I fell in love with it. Um, it's Reservation Dogs. She just, oh my god, yes. It's on FX. You know what I'm talking about, girl. Yes. Yeah. Just ended the second season. So good. And if you're not watching, mm-hmm. if you're not watching the show, this is a show that's created and, and developed by this Native Native American person, Sterling Harjo and, and Taika Waititi. And it's about four native kids who live in a reservation town and basically them want to get out of that reservation their reservation town and so they're stealing to try to get money to, to go to California all this is based around one of their friends and I think somebody's cousin of the group uh, dies he kills himself I think and yep. they want to go to California for him but it's got great characters in it um, go look for the podcast the, the movies that made, made me uh, Sterler Harjo was on there, and he did he did his little schmiel on there, and he uh, he had to fight to have all these native actors on this show, and yeah, so it's ninety five percent native actors, and I'm fine with that because they, they all interact so well, and Wes Studi's on there, and he, he signs for free through the mail, and I want to send him so bad a picture of him from that from that show. And let them call me a shit ass because that's what all the adults call the kids on the show. Shit asses, <laughs> right, he's you know? a bunch of shit asses. <laughs> uh, but even now, I, t- I tell my sister when we get in the car, and she's like taking her time. I'll say Skoden. Yeah, is, Skoden. Yeah, which is native slang for it. Let's go then. You know, they use this on the <laughs> show, so then I started using it in, in real life, which is like, yeah, um, reservation dogs. So check it out. I, I, I think it's like. It's like a Native American stand by me, people. Just check it out. It is. It really is. And then, uh, yeah, and uh, uh, Zane McClernan in, in there, Officer Big. Oh, Officer Big. He's so good. <laughs> so good. Him. He's great. And then Dallas Coltooth as William. Mm-hmm. Oh! Oh! <laughs> yeah, you'll laugh at it. You get, you get sad. I mean. Yeah, it, it, it does everything to you. It really does. does. It really good. does. Very good. I mean, FX is killing it. You know, like HBO is killing it. it, it it's, it's like um, The Old Man was terrific, and I hope it gets a second season. If you didn't watch that, that's that show with John Lithgow and Jeff Bridges. Where um, John Lithgow, you know, Jeff Bridges was an assassin, and uh, John Lithgow was basically hiding him for 20, 70 years from, from some bad people. And the bad people find out where he is, and he has to go on the run, just killing people. And it's uh, it's, it's really good, too, The Old Man. Oh, that sounds good. Well, yeah, Reservation Dogs. If you, you, you ain't watching it yet, you guys should check it out because it's, uh, it's terrific. It is. It's really good. 
it, and you know, it makes you kind of think and, uh, you know, it's kind of sympathize because, you know, it's, you know, yes, they're all indigenous, but you know, when you start to see how they live and stuff, it's, you know, it could be a story of, you know, some kids in the ghetto, you know, or in one of the barrios or something. And, you know, everybody's plot in life. So it's, it's really, really good. Yeah, me and Iris are here tonight that would talk about two films in which somebody goes inside somebody's head, basically, and <laughs> sometimes more wacky ways, which we'll talk about in our first film. Uh, this shit gets bonkers real fast. Um, we're doing Dream- it sure does. Dreamscape from 1984, and The Cell, I want to say, from 2001, right in that area. It's 2000. 2000. I knew it was right in that area, though. Mm-hmm. Oh, my gosh. And we're going to start with Dreamscape, and we're going to do that right after this trailer. Alex Gardner has a unique talent, and even he doesn't know what it can do. No one has ever done it before. No one has even conceived of doing it before. Going into another person's dream. If I have to see that, David. He is about to enter a world that no one has ever seen before. The world of your dreams. I was under the impression we were conducting scientific research here. You sound as if you don't approve. I can see you're going to be a real challenge to work with. Oh, wait a minute, Doctor. I haven't agreed to anything yet. There's somebody in my dreams. Who? An awful ugly monster. This kid is being eaten alive and nobody gives a damn. Whatever his demon is, I have to help him face it. There's nobody there. Are you sure, Alex? He's always there. But Alex will make a discovery more frightening than any dream. What's going on? I had to let you know you're in danger. You want my secrets? This wants some advice. I'm afraid he has to be killed. I'll assign some men to you. I think I should deal with this on my own. And now, his only way out is to go back in to the dreamscape. Kate Capshaw, Dreamscape. When you close your eyes, the adventure begins. That's Dreamscape from 1984. Uh, your basic plot synopsis is a man who can enter and manipulate people's dreams was recruited by a government agency to help cure the President of the United States of his nightmares about nuclear war, but stumbles upon an assassination plot. Uh, this is directed by Joseph Rubin, who uh, gave us stuff like The Good Son, which I have no problem with, and The Stepfather, and Sleeping with the Enemy. He gave us some, some decent shit there, as far as the director goes. And uh, one episode, I didn't even know it was a breaking away TV show um, about the kids who ride bikes. But apparently <laughs> it was a breaking away TV show. Uh, also directed True Believer with James Spader, and I, I, I want to say James Woods. This is in that movie. It's been a while. Yes, he is. Money Train, not so good. It gets not so good from here on in. Because, you know, you're still like the forgotten with, with, with um, Ginger Lady. Uh, J- Julianne Moore. Gin- oh. <laughs> still I like out Ginger today. Lady. <laughs> she, she, she's a spicy Ginger Lady. Uh, this is a story by D- David L- Lothry. I hard uh, to pronounce that last name. But uh, screenplay by Chuck Russell, who we all know from The Blob and Nightmare 3 and The Hidden. You know, lots lots of good shit. Um, and Joseph Rubin, who I don't know anything. Well, yeah, you just mentioned him. <laughs> also wrote the screenplay. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, your stars of this film. Uh, Dennis Quaid as Alex Gardner. Max von Sydow as Dr. Paul Novotny. There we go. Uh, Christopher Plummer as uh, the very bad Bob Blair in this movie. Uh, Eddie Albert, yes, that Eddie Albert from Green Acres as the president. Uh, yep, yep, yep. <laughs> Kate Capshaw as uh, Jane DeVries. Um, that Kate Capshaw, yeah, you know that one. Um, David Patrick Kelly playing a nasty character once again as uh, Tommy Ray Glattman. George Wendt as Charlie Prince, 
who um, plays like a like a like Stephen King in this movie, who who's on the trail. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you get some great character actors as well. You get you get Peter Jason pops up as uh, as uh, one of Christopher Plumber's number twos, and Chris Mulkey shows up as as his other number two, and it's always good to see those. And um, and Mister, I'll buy that for a dollar. Oh, he's in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Larry Gelman. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, my fault. I didn't, I didn't know that. Um, yeah, there he is, right there. And uh, I, I got to mention because there's a scene where there's a snake man in two parts of this movie, oh, yeah. played by an actor named Larry Cedar, who you, you see do a lot of creature work, but also as a person, uh, he, he plays the the the, the, car- the creature on the wing in Twilight Zone, the movie. And but he also plays in like human parts and like. Chud Two, which I I, I I unapologetically love, he plays the the Robert Vaughn's number two in that movie, and he's in Feds, which is a film I've watched on HBO about 150 times, with Mary Gross and Rebecca De Mornay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that's that's always fun to talk about about Larry Cedar and things, and um, very thin actor. He does a lot of creature work and humor work too. I I, I love this guy. But um, this is the first time I've seen this all the way through. Um, I only seen bits and pieces of it, so I'm I'm a stick at Diaries first and ask her her thoughts on Dreamscape. All right, so Dreamscape, uh, very much a 1980s movie. Yeah, you've got the soundtrack, you know that weird synthesizer stuff. Um, <laughs> I swear, Dennis Quaid looks like he belongs in a Disney movie because um, he's just so young looking in this one. And, you know, and, and it's that smile, right? That just intoxicating smile that he has. It just makes you feel good. Um, story-wise, it's interesting, right? I I, I like the science or the, the, the science fiction behind it, I should say, of being able to psychically or aided by, uh, you know, by drugs, uh, medication to be able to get into somebody else's head, into their other dream, and be able to help them out that way. Uh, and um, the story within itself of the president and you know the president wanting to disarm the United States of uh, you know nuclear disarmament, which in 1984 was a big deal. Uh, Ronnie Reagan, you know, had his salt and all that other stuff. You know, the, the Star Wars and all that was was very big politically back then. So, of course, Hollywood has to, you know, do a social commentary. Um, And just how underhanded, um, you know, black ops can be. So very interesting, very much a, uh, I'd have to say a snapshot of the time back then. But there is a lot of stuff in this movie that had they made it now the way it is, uh, I mean, it would ruffle some serious feathers. Like, first of all, the um, the scene where Dennis Quaid gets inside of, uh, or Alex, I should say, gets inside of Jane's dream and stuff ensues. <laughs> uh, I think nowadays people would call that, like, sexual assault rape, I guess. Yeah, because it's, it's fucking... It was not consensual, it's right? It's not consensual, no. <laughs> I mean, you could argue it, I guess, but it really wasn't. It's, <laughs> and it's, it, not you know, like, it's not like that scene in Demolition Man where Sandra Bullock says, let's sit down and put these things in our heads and have sex. You know, it's not that. Like, right, no. It's like, I'm going to sneak into her room and just, you know, <laughs> let's let's dig around, let's root around and see what's inside there, you know. You're not going to get inside your brain and I'm going to make you want me. Um, yeah, you know, that was that was interesting. Um <laughs> But, you know, again, sign of the times, right? Um, at that time, uh, it, it wasn't thought of as a big deal. And I, I guess now we're a little bit more adult or mature. I, I don't know what you want to call it, but still. Um, and, you know, of course, you have Max uh, von Sydow. How I love this man. I love listening to him talk. And um, he's kind of like a, a father figure to Alex, in a way, and uh, the way he, he ends up, it, it always makes me sad. And um, practical effects in these, pretty awesome. You have stop motion animation, which, you know, again, it's 1984, right? You know, 
not a lot of CG being done at the time. But to me, it was done decently. And um, you have to give the, to this movie, though, the atmosphere that it sets in the dreamscapes is very effective for me. It was very effective when I saw it in the movie theater as a kid, and it was still very effective for me now. So, yeah, I mean, I always enjoy this movie whenever I throw it on. It's lots of fun. And, of course, you've got people like Eddie Albert and Christopher Plummer playing just a complete black optic head. Um, that he's so good at doing that. Uh, but, yeah, and then, of course, you can't, we can't forget uh, David Patrick Kelly, which is Tommy Ray. Tommy Ray was kind of like um, he was the big man on campus until Alex showed up. And uh, Tommy Ray did not take it too lightly, especially since um, as you start as they start developing his character, you find out things about Tommy Ray. I don't want to give a lot out away because I don't know how many people have watched this or not, really. But it, it's kind of interesting, um, the character development there and the rivalry. But again, you know, it's a 1984 movie. Uh, if you sit down and watch this for the first time, don't don't expect, you know, like flashbang, woo, zip, wow. It's 1984. There's a lot of practical effects. And um, I mean, it, it's decent. It's a decent story, a decent movie. And I really enjoy it. OK, now, if you first go into this movie, you know, if you watch like, the first like half hour, 40 minutes, you think, oh, this is just scanners light. This is yes. what this is. And, you know. And then you start getting the meat and potatoes of the movie where you find out these guys can actually go into people's dreams. That's what this is all about, them going to collect Dennis Quaid and saying, okay, we, we have a problem here, and, you know, we, we need we need the best, the best of the best. This is the guy who left us, you know, while he was still in his prime, I guess, but didn't want to, didn't want to do it anymore. And, you know, for, for good reason. He, he felt like he'd been used, and he's going to be used probably as a weapon for the government. And, you know, who knows? But he... Yeah, that's that's their intention. Um, but then it, it makes that churn to to find out, you know, why the president is so important. It, it goes right in the beginning. This is this is the eighties, the early early eighties. This is the Cold War. This is the fear mm -hmm. of nuclear destruction. This is the dead zone. You know, when Christopher Walken touches Martin Sheen's hand, he can see his finger on the button and what he what he intends to do when he becomes president. I mean. The fact that these nightmares are so important to Christopher Plummer is, is it's not like they're, they could resonate into real things, but they could resonate into real things. So he's a villain, but he's not really a villain. He's really after the best interests of, you know, you know what could happen. Cause Eddie right, Howard, it's, it's, it's America. It's America. Right. And Eddie yeah. Howard basically is, is telling him what he's dreaming about and, and, what, what, and telling him what he's capable of doing. Which is, you know, in the right, in the right circumstances, he's not afraid to push that button. Not afraid to say, okay, nuclear fallout for everybody. And this, of course, you know, ruffles some feathers. And he's going to go to this institute, you know, to, to help him with his dreams. And Dennis Quaid is down, but not down for that. And uh, Kate Capshaw is, 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 I guess, is his... his uh, Maiden fair scientist and all of this, and she acts a little bit better than she does in, in Temple of Doom because she's kind of subdued here, and she, she's playing a role. And that, that's all I can really say about that. And but there's there's parts of this film where you where, where you can go inside people's heads, and like you said, the sequences were real fine, especially you know we, we, he's helping the boy. And he, he, you, see, yeah. you, you see that snake man, and yeah, David Patrick Kelly's a piece of shit. <laughs> uh, he is, isn't he's, he? A, he's a piece of shit in many, many things, but I think this is his biggest piece of shit role ever, because uh, this is a spoiler that I give you. You come to find out that he, he figured out the power of how to hurt somebody in their dreams, like manipulate dreams to hurt somebody in, in real life. So if they die in the dream, they die for real, much like a Nightmare on Elm Street. But I think this came out the same year, I think. So I'm not sure who developed what first or whatever. But there's even a part in the movie <laughs> where they're in the dream and David Patrick Kelly uh, sticks his hand out for, so it's for nails to come out, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, yes, he has a little Freddy Krueger moment there. So that, 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 that money came first. I, I don't know. It's, it's really silly, but then again... 
he figures out a way how to uh, manipulate the dreams. To where Dennis Quaid, you know, he figures it out right away, you know, thankfully, because he's the hero of this movie. It's something has to be done. But, um, it's, it's, it's really wild in that sense, but it goes into, like, government espionage. You know, he, he tries to escape, and the, Christopher Plummer's goons are still after him. And he has to find out what's going on. And so it goes from that to that, to, to this whole subplot with George Wendt, where he's a writer, but it happens to know things. And it's just, it, once, once it gets that ball rolling... And you get to the bonkers ending to where they go into the dreams and stuff to do dangerous stuff. It, it, it all comes together. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not, not like a question of, you know, sh- should Christopher Walken kill Martin Sheen's character in Dead Zone? Is, is, um, is Christopher Plummer really the bad guy in this movie? Because it's, it's kind of hard to say. And I love villains like that that are conflicted. I, are, are they villains? Are they not villains? Are they doing what's right for, for the greater good? You know, and I, I think he plays it really good because he's, he's fucking Christopher Plummer. And yeah. He outshines Max von Sydow in this movie. That's real hard to do sometimes. And it, it's, it is. It really is, isn't it? But um, I, I, all in all, I enjoyed the hell out of it. I thought it was just different enough as the A's movie. It was really wacky, but the, the wackiness worked as far as the plot goes. And... I, I, I would watch this again. It's, 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 it's pretty it's pretty good. It's not perfect, but I uh, I enjoy the the everything about it. You know, yeah. Right on. Um, anything else that you want to say about the film, Iris? And what do you give it one to ten? Okay, I'm going to give this an eight uh, because you know anytime I put it on, I enjoy it. Um, it's one of the you know it's like it's a very nostalgic movie for me. You know, I was. I mean, the first time I saw it was in the theater and I was a kid and, you know, with my parents and all. And, and, you know, just like any other time, you know, we really liked this movie and then we brought more people to it to come watch movies. So, um, yeah, I'll give it an eight, a solid eight. Cool. Like I said, one of the ones on HBO that I, I caught parts of, didn't quite know what the fuck was going on. I can see a lot, a lot, a lot of movies that I catch now that I, I watch bits and pieces of. And so like I said, it really held together. You know, the plot... The plot for this movie that probably shouldn't work works really, really well. And all the effects, you know, they, 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 they took the time to, 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 to make them look good. Although, if, if you watch it now, uh, I guess the, 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 the Dante's Inferno Holocaust, you know, dream, you know, visual. Yeah. It looks kind of crappy now, but that's like the really only bad thing about it now. Is mm-hmm. the exterior of the, the part where they're on the train looks kind of janky. But, you know, it, it is what it is. Yeah. I've seen a lot worse. But, um, fun. The actors are great. Even the small ones. Like I said, I love seeing Chris Mulkey and Peter Jason and things. Just just, just showing up. Um, you got a lot of that in the 80s, too. Yeah. But if you don't know who Chris Mulkey is, just just, just look up the character's face. And you'll, you'll just say, yeah, I've seen that guy in, like, 15 things in the 80s and 90s, at least. And, um... Yeah, good time. 8 out of 10 for me, too. I, I, would, I would give it that rating as well. Uh, if you want to watch this, I think Screen Factory has a Blu-ray of it. And you can watch this on Tubi as well. So go yeah. check, uh, check it out on Tubi. Don't, don't underestimate your Tubi action, because there's a lot of good stuff on Tubi that you don't got to pay for. and Just watch it with a couple little ads. And it, it's a uh, world-class prints, too, by the way. This was this is a beautiful print on there. Um... That's it for this one. We're going to get into, uh, next up, we're going to get into um, a gem, I think, from, from the year 2000 called The Cell. And we're going to get into that right after the trailer. Do you believe there's a part of yourself that you don't show anybody when I'm inside? Feel them. These girls were kidnapped, tortured, and murdered. Our killer is a white male, about 30 years old. Carl Rudolph Sarger was at the house under surveillance for about 20 minutes. He keeps them in this thing for about 40 hours. <laughs> Clear. 
And after 40 hours, the water starts. And it doesn't stop. There is a girl that is missing. And her name is Julia Hickson. He is the only one that knows where she is. If he was conscious, do you think that he would tell you where she is? Are you sure? I'm sure. You bring in this monster, and you're asking her to go into that mine. She's made contact. She's lost. She thinks this is real. I'm going in to get her. Cell, the year 2000. Um, your basic plot synopsis is an FBI agent pers- pursue, per- persuades a social worker, I almost said pursues there, uh, who is uh, adept with a new experimental technology to enter the mind of a comatose serial killer in order to, to learn where he has hidden his latest kidnapped victim. Uh, this is directed by a director called Tarsum Singh, who only gave us a couple things. Um, uh, we call the fall. Actually, I've seen the poster for which I, I've never actually watched the film. And uh, maybe after this is this is done, I'm gonna watch it this weekend sometime because I really enjoy this one. And that's probably yeah, a lot of that non-commercial stuff. Uh, let's get the, the the writer here. Mark Protosevich, who uh, wrote the I Am Legend remake, the Old Boy remake, and the Poseidon remake. Now I can vouch for that. Oh, wow. I can vouch for the Poseidon remake, which I, I kind of enjoyed actually. The Poseidon Adventure remake and had a, had a, had a big cast in it. I think uh, Kurt Russell plays Reverend Scott in that movie, so you can check that out if you want to. Um, this stars Jennifer Lopez uh, as Catherine Dean. I never had a problem with her as an actress. I, uh, I'll get into that in a little bit here. Uh, Vince Vaughn as Peter Novak. Mrs. Uh, Dino- D'Onofrio. Brilliantly. Uh, oh, wow. That's totally. Carl, that's Carl Starger, man. He's good shit, man. Uh, Colton James as Edward Baines. Uh, the amazing Dylan Baker as Henry West. Marianne Jean Baptiste as Dr. Miriam Kent. Oh, who else shows up in this film that I got excited about? <sighs> James Gammon shows up in this film with Teddy Lee. Uh, yeah, that was so cool. <laughs> if you guys know who he is, he plays the coach in Major League and other things. And, uh, and uh, Dean Norris shows up in this film as one of the Asians. I, I always love Dean Norris in anything. And he's always that guy in the background that either you notice or you don't notice. And he he has lines and stuff, but he just, he just shows up in good shit, and he's good in it. Um, this is a very bizarre and very influenced film but by by many. I, I say Joe Dorowski's uh, amongst those directors. Uh, Iris, I'll let you kick it off again. What do you think of the cell, babe? Oh, well, you know, this movie is just so visually stunning. It is an extremely visual movie. And, uh, you know, the director, Tarsum Singh, he really, really excels at movies like this. Um, If you haven't watched The Fall, The Fall is another movie that is extremely visual. Um. Well, when you when you sit down and watch it, Gary, you'll go, oh, yeah, yeah, I can see why The Cell was The Cell, because, of you know, this movie, it, it follows suit. Uh, the story and the plot line for this, I find extremely interesting, right? Who has not ever wanted to get into somebody else's head? Seriously. Um, this, the way they do it here is a little bit more 
techno savvy and a little bit more sciencey than the other in, in Dreamscape. And uh, Jennifer Lopez, I like you. I have never had problems with her as an actor uh, or an actress. You know, I I think she does well. And in this in this role, she really she really comes across as you know somebody that's extremely caring and the reason why she's doing this work is because she has such sympathy and empathy for the children that she's helping. So <clears throat> when serial killer, he, he's also a very interesting character. He's, he's creepy. Oh my God. He's so fucking creepy with, you know, his suspension rings on his back and what he does with the women by create, you know, just bleaching them completely. So they look more like dolls. Um, and then, you know, stuff ensues. They find out who this guy is because of his very unique dog that he has. Uh, they arrest him. And the problem is, is that as they're going in to arrest him, he's supposed to take some pills to keep um, kind of like a seizure from happening. And he didn't get to his pills in time. So he's basically comatose and uh, he's kind of like gone. So, of course, they ask Catherine Dean and she's like, nope, not doing it. And they're like, somebody's going to die in 40 hours. She's like, OK, fine. So she goes in um, and she gets scared shitless in there and she comes out and she's like, nope, not doing that again. And just in that little time that she was in there, at one point, um, the guy has cataloged all of his kills and he kind of has them like in little exhibition boxes. And it's creepy as fuck, man. The The practical effects in this are just amazing. The makeup, everything in this, uh, extremely, again, extremely visual. And um, <laughs> so he has this kind of like, I guess, bodyguard. Uh, a, a Stargar has a, this bodyguard female in there. And... Um, can't, she used to be a huge uh, bodybuilder back in uh, back in the 2000s. I can't remember her name, but uh, so she knocks her out and takes her. And, and the very first time that you see Starker as Starker, the god that he believes he is, it's this room with um, just all of these curtains. It looks like a huge curtain or something. And as he's walking down his throne, He's pulling these curtains on on the suspension rings on it. it. It's just so visually beautiful, right? And the colors, everything in this. And at some point, um, you know, Catherine knows that if she's in his mind, she will not be able to beat him because she goes in again and he captures her in, in her dream. And, um, of course, then Vince Vaughn has to go in there and rescue her, blah, blah, blah. Again, very visual, very beautifully stunning. Um, <laughs> what he does and everything, it, it's just this movie is just so wow. You know, it, it, it for me, it really captures my imagination and it really gives you a sense of this dream world. And it gets to the point where Catherine knows that she can't beat him in his head. So she brings him into hers and when she is like this beautiful Virgin Mary like creature and she's vengeful and takes care of everything. And she's also um, compassionate to the point where um, basically it's a mercy killing. Um, it's just, I don't know. This movie has always stunned me on how beautifully a story could be told by not a lot of words or talking, but just, by the set and the atmosphere and how costumes, all of that. And, and that's what this movie does. And Singh is, is an expert at this. He's very, very good at this. So, uh, yeah, this is another one that I like to revisit quite a bit. Um, I do have the, the Blu-ray that I couldn't dig out some when I was watching this. So I had to watch it on my iPad and it, it looked like shit. But it to me, it's still visuals, visually stunning. So, um, a serious recommend for this one. Yeah, just if you think of this film, just think of like you know, Silence of the Lambs. You know, they call Buffalo Bill real early in the film, and because mm -hmm. it, 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 it could say, oh, this is kind of like that, but they didn't waste a lot of time with the procedural because once once they caught him, 
you know, you go right into it. She's about a half an hour into the film. But before this, she's almost like plain white child psychologist. To right. This, to, to this one boy who has been a, a case of hers for a long time because he's haunted by this boogeyman that's inside of his head. So he's in a coma because of this and trying to free him from this. So that, that boogeyman comes into play later, not not in, in the form that he's in in the little boy's dream, but in the same sense as when Victor Starger was a boy, you come to find out he confesses to her. Because right away, you know, when she goes inside of his head, that she sees him as a boy. And this this is the abused Victor Starger. This is the kid, this is the kid that was beaten by his father to where he... he he did something, and he broke three ribs and, and broke his jaw. His... Yeah, and he was only six years old. Yeah, so this this is that little boy she's talking to. So that that, that connection is there, and again, like 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 I said, it's a very bizarre looking film. I mean, Vince Vaughn, he, he must have had great great times with his freaking makeup, just playing this malevolent being inside of his dream because he's he's real. He's really simple looking. He almost looks like, again, you go back to the country real man. He looks like Anton Chigurh. If he, yeah. if he was albino and had, you know, five inch hooks hanging from uh, rings hanging from his back, so he real S and M shit. I mean that that scene where he's got the dead girl all bleached up and he he's got her in the house or in the silo. I forget where where he had her, but and he has those hooks hanging to the chains and he's hanging himself up over her and. The sense of power there, you know, is is it just makes it all that much more weird. And um, big reason to watch this movie is D'Onofrio's performance. Because yes, without him, you will not be afraid of this man. But you are fucking terrified of this man and what he's capable of. You know, within his own dream, the power within his own dream, and the power of of, of him as a man. So of course, you know, he starts getting all shaky and shit, and he can't do it anymore. But, uh, it's, 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 just, it's just really good, and I love this film since it came out. I don't think it was very successful as a film. I think because a lot of folks didn't have a lot of faith in J-Lo as an actress. Again, I, 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 I don't have that faith, that, that non-faith in her. I think she's good in funny stuff. I think she's great in serious stuff. Mm-hmm. There's a film um, called Enough which is like Sleeping with the Enemy. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Which is really good with her in it. Uh, there's there's a film, there's films I like that she's in that, that, that shouldn't be so good. Uh, like The Boy Next Door, which is a, a, a like a Lifetime movie, but, but on the big screen, where she's flirting with this young, this, this young hunky dude, and this young hunky dude starts to blackmail her and shit. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, um, Again, J Lo in movies is, is not is not necessarily a bad thing. Go, go watch go watch Monster in Law and laugh her ass off because she goes toe to toe with Jane Fonda. Oh my God, Monster in Law is so good. Toe to toe with Jane Fonda in that movie. It, it yes. is it's fucking hilarious. It really is, and um, great chemistry there. Um, but this movie, I, I like I said, I never seen The Fall, but I'm I'm gonna go watch it now because this guy impressed me with one movie. And he, he didn't get to make many movies. He made a lot of music videos. I think he made Mirror Mirror for Disney, which is like a, um, a Snow White thing with Julia Roberts. And which is a shame. You, 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 you probably got ate up by the Hollywood system. It wasn't too successful. And you, you want to see more for, from this director. Um, yeah. Because it is just visually appealing and, and so satisfying in the end to, to, to where. You have this beast in this, in this inside of his head, and she almost frees him in a way from his own, yeah, she his, does. His own pain. It's not like saying, "Oh, mm-hmm. this guy, this guy is is a bad guy," and he is a bad guy. He's doing he's doing terrible things, and he has women inside water tanks and gradually filling it up with water, but you know, feeding him at the same time, but like, torturing him in a way, and and those terrible things. But it it's all stems from you know abuse. You know, and yeah, don't don't be mean to your kids. That's that's uh, don't don't do that. And but this this a uh, it's got a really great ending. Not, not, not to the point of saying, oh, I've defeated the bad guy. Like no, I fr- I freed the bad guy. And you, yes, you have to appreciate something like that in a film like this. I think, and 
It's, it's much more deeper. This film, this film has lots of depth. Yeah, and, uh, I see people are scared away by certain things, and that's a that's a fucking shame because y'all should go back and watch rewatch the cell or watch it for the first time because it is a uh, it is it is appealing on the eyes and fucking tragic as hell and if you like sort of police procedural stuff it has a little bit of that in there but not not to overwhelm the film which yeah, there, there, that's the other thing I like about it is there was just enough of that there to say okay we set it up and now here's the beat potatoes of what's going to happen next and that, that's that's what happens that's what happens next you know even in the end you know where they're, they're searching his house and she still wants to know more about this person that was this monster. And, and the, the curiosity is there. The, 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 the sympathy is there, too. And I, 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 I got to appreciate that. I really do. Because it's, it's a little bit of both, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm done. I'm spent, Iris. So what, what do you give <laughs> 1 to 10 and anything else you want to say about it? Okay, I'm going to give it uh, a 9 and also... Uh... Just for some of the stuff, like um, the detail that he goes into uh, when D'Onofrio is in his um, god state, right? And he has those horns. When you, If you really, in the Blu-ray, you can, and, and in the movie, I think, too, regular-wise, you can see that it's his hair that has been molded into these horns, in, in which, you know, to me, it was like, wow, that's that's... This beautiful, it's just a beautiful way of showing that, right? It's just, you know, all of the details, just a, a very beautiful detail in this movie. Um, so I'm going to give this a nine because I really, really enjoy this. And fuck, who doesn't want to look at J-Lo, right? So, yeah, a nine. Yeah, the visuals, and I, I didn't mention the wardrobes that you were mentioning. Yeah. The wardrobes in these two films glorious is when they're inside the dream and uh, the, the the design of the suits where they have to go inside the dream mm-hmm. looking like uh, Dracula at the beginning yes of Dracula in a way you know like it was the armor yeah oh it's, it's it's just it's a wild ride and it's it's, it's a satisfying one and I mean I've seen so many of these film like try, try to be artsy but have like one of those those studs of an ending that make you want to churn it off uh, this uh, this film has a very satisfying ending, and that where where you can tell this director will say, okay, they're, they're giving me this freedom to do basically what I want, but at the same time give them a, a, a Hollywood ending that I would be content with, and you would hope the the, the watching audience will be too, because it's not it's not that, that simple. You, you really got to dig you really got to uh, dig, dig deep into to the the psyche and the the, the plot of this movie to say. Okay, you either get that you're supposed to sympathize with the killer or, or not. I mean, because it wasn't just a ploy to say, okay, now the killer is dead, yay. Like, no, she, she, she was helping him in, the day, in, in a way. Yeah. She was doing her job. Um, D'Onofrio, though, if you're not a fan of D'Onofrio in, in, in everything, I, I, I don't think you have a right to be a movie fan because he, <laughs> in everything, he's such a versatile actor. I mean, he's he's great. He's a great character uh, uh, actor. He's in this. He's in you know, Law and Order: Criminal Intent. I would argue is probably the best Law and Order show when he was on there. I mean, he, he was terrific on that show. Um, if you haven't seen the Magnificent Re- uh, Seven remake, give yourself a, give yourself a, give it a chance because I really enjoyed it. And he plays a character in that film that's bearded and and kills people with tomahawks. You know? Yep. Uh, it's, it's a lot. It's it's stupid fun. It really is, people. Uh, of course, coming back as the kingpin on the Daredevil series, um, the the best at it. I mean, come on. If you watch that Daredevil series, you see him crush that guy's head in the door. I'm like, yeah, he he's not as tall as the kingpin, but you know what? He is an imposing fucking figure. Uh, yeah, it is. Yes, indeed. Yeah, so many great things in our reels, and and J J Lo too. J Lo deserves more love as, as far as her acting stuff goes. Um, but that that's about it for this one. What, what I, I didn't give it a rating. I, I give it nine out of ten too. It's, it's, All right, it's, it's pretty great. And um, 
It's it's a, it's it's, it's a, almost perfect. Apparently, it was a nine out of ten. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, yeah, that's it for this one. We're, we're going to come back and close out the show. This will keep you quiet. Oh, hi there. I didn't see you. You caught me cutting a new show. I'm Bo Ransdell, and I'm one of the many creators you can find on Legion Podcasts. I said quiet. My fellow podcasters and I work hard to bring you the best in horror podcasting, but that comes at a cost. What's that like to live deliciously? Not that, but also, yes. No, what I'm getting at is that there are server costs, costs for good microphones and software for editing, all the things that make our shows, you know, fun to listen to. And you can help. If you're enjoying the shows on legionpodcasts.com or in the Legion Network available on iTunes and Stitcher, just about anywhere you can download a podcast, really, you can help us out and get a little something for your trouble at patreon.com forward slash legionpodcasts. For just two bucks a month, you get a pair of movie commentaries exclusive to Patreon, and for five dollars, you can also join us for a monthly screening of a movie. All of that available on patreon.com forward slash legion podcasts. We appreciate it, and thank you for listening. Now, back to the cutting room. Ah, that's the, uh, reached the end of the journey on this one, I'm, um, damn, damn happy to say that we record a brand new episode, and... I don't know which one you'll hear first, this or the, the last part of the beef anniversary. I'm going with this one first because I want to record a beginning part of that beef anniversary, and I I have the, the means to make it really special. And I think that once my co-hosts hear it, they want to do what I'm going to do to uh, <laughs> be the subject of, of uh, this experiment that I stole from Joe Dante and, and Josh Olson from their show. But um, I put a little twist on it. Um yeah, that's coming up after this one. Uh, beyond that, I have no idea. I talked to you, um, Matt and Kate from the Eternal S- Sunshine of the Not So Spotless Mind podcast. We've been in the works to get them on for a while. So it'll probably be a weekend show, Iris. So just let me know. You know, if you have a weekend day open. Oh, cool! Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll get together with them because they're they're in the UK, obviously. Oh yeah, that's right. And um, but yeah, other stuff going. Look for the bonuses coming to the Patreon, the, the Torchies ones, and the Burnt Ends episodes of this one. Um, uh, I, I'd like to say exciting stuff's happening, but I, I feel confident in saying that, that exciting stuff is coming. Uh, Heck yeah. But, um, Iris, anything you want to push, girl? You anything else happening with the, with the crime podcast or anything? Uh, no, not really. Right now, I'm kind of like in a holding pattern, and, and you're it, Gary. You're it. I feel so, so blessed, you know, and I mean that in so many ways, yeah. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> Ditto. Have, have, have my peoples, you know. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, this show, a multitude of other shows that when they come out, they come out. Last Call of Torchies, Burning for Springwood, Two Drink Venom Commentaries can all be found under the, the Butcher Shop banner on your podcatcher. Go look for them there, uh, unless you want to subscribe to Cinnamon Beef and Two Drink Venom separately. Those feeds still exist. The other stuff can be found on the, the butcher shop. Uh, yeah, just look for the butcher shop and just get all get all those goodies up in you. I mentioned the bonus ones. The bonus ones can be found on Legion Patreon. If you haven't started donating to that yet, it's it's two dollars a month minimum. And you get all the court psyops radio edits of, of the cinema psyops show, and you get um, early releases from Bo. You get early, you get um, sometimes early releases from this show. If I'm feeling up, up and up and froggy, to say, "Hey, here it is earlier." I just put it up the next day, whatever. But um, the most important thing on there is to go look for the last call of Torchy's bonus shows and the Burnt Ends bonus shows, and who knows, you might get a commentary from the from Suzanne, Iris, and myself on something special one of these days, and find it on there. Uh, the most important thing is though this we are recording on National Podcast Day, so if you haven't donated to the Legion Petri Patreon, you don't have to. But then again, you don't get all the cool bonus stuff either if you don't. And that two dollars a month, that two bucks a month, you know, supports uh, 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 the greater good of the Legion podcast. So it's 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 it's, it's not saying it's the least you can do. I'm just saying it's something you can do, and if you want to. Go for it, you know. 
pay, leave your Patreon. Beautiful thing. Uh, <laughs> but um, that's about it for this one. We'll see you all next time. This has been your Cine Beef Podcast, where if you've got beef, we've got the grinder. See you next time.